So I'm excited to hear uh, Professor Hager's thoughts on observing, learning, and executing fine grain manipulation uh, systems today, manipulation activities today. And uh, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you for that, that introduction. Uh, and it is a, a pleasure to be back and uh, to be back in person. I think this is officially my second in-person seminar. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, all of you who are out there on Zoom, I understand it's convenient to, to listen in on Zoom, but you should come here and be here in person. It's a lot more fun. Um, I just thought since uh, yeah, we actually just had the 40th uh, anniversary of the grass lab and, and I was, was preparing for this talk kind of thinking about it. it I, I do want to kind of say uh, you know, a few words about the, you know, how GRASP and uh, you know, the University of Pennsylvania were really uh, formative experiences. I mean, you know, the fact that I do work in computer vision and I do work in robotics and I do work in medicine is really not by accident. I think it's more by uh, how uh, the lab really thought back in those days when uh, you know, Rishina formed it and we were really starting to pull together faculty. Uh, you know, there, there is, this is a picture literally outside my office. Should you want to know where that is, if you walk in the front door of uh, right off the corner of 34th and uh, Walnut, that building there, and you go to the right, there used to be offices there and ENIAC was just sitting out. Uh, so if you wanted a souvenir, you just reached back behind and you grabbed the vacuum tube and you took it away with you. Um, but, uh, you know, this was the crew at the time. And, you know, the interesting thing is to, to really realize just how diverse the, the set of people that were there were and the fact that we, you know, we didn't kind of think in a box, you know, there weren't just roboticists there trying to think about how to do kinematics and dynamics. There weren't just computer vision people there trying to do uh, edge detection. Uh, you know, we had people from cognitive science, we had people from medical imaging. Uh, so it really was kind of an, an intellectual crossroads of lots of different areas. And I will say, you know, as the fields have evolved, uh, it, you know, it's great that all of these, these fields have really blossomed in many different ways. But I would urge all of you, particularly the students, to, to kind of always be open to the fact that, that you know, you've got to be heads down and do the work that you're trying to do but try to find uh, a diverse set of people to interact with and talk with. Because I think throughout my career, that's really what has, has shaped me. You know, I was just as happy talking with somebody about programming languages and type theory as I was talking about computer vision, as I was talking about computer architecture. And I, I think we're, as a field, you know, as we've gotten bigger, it, it's harder and harder to maintain those connections, but I think that's where the value is. And, and I think that's really what Grasp Lab uh, back at the beginning gave me. And I, I just wanted to, to recognize that, as well as just pull up an old photo and prove that I was young once too. Um, uh, I also wanted to just do a quick ad. So I'm coming from the University of Pennsylvania, or from, I was from the University of Pennsylvania, coming from Johns Hopkins University at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so one of the things that I had the pleasure of doing uh, together with my colleagues in about 2007 is uh, uh, creating the Laboratory for Computational Sensing and Robotics. And I will say full out that our goal was to emulate in many ways the GRASP lab by having a multidisciplinary lab across departments and across different areas, including you know, all walks of, of scientists uh, in that area. And uh, if you are an undergraduate thinking of going to grad school or a master's student thinking of going for a PhD or a PhD looking for a postdoc or a postdoc looking for a job, come find us because uh, we are looking for great people. And while it may not be exactly the grass lab, I think it's, it's a pretty close approximation in many ways. And then just uh, briefly uh, kind of drilling down to, to my lab, as you heard, I, I tend to do work that uh, crosses many boundaries. Uh, we do a lot of work in activity understanding. Uh, we've done a lot of work in you know, vision-based manipulation and you know, surgery I think is uh, uh, where probably uh, I've done a lot of the, the work that people would, would say was really pioneering. Uh, ironically enough, I'm not gonna talk about surgery today. Like typically I will pull out surgery and tell you about that, but I'm actually gonna talk about the, the two ends of the spectrum, namely understanding activity, time series analysis of image data, and then also how we kind of turn the idea of, of understanding activity into actually performing uh, activities. Uh, so the, the kind of starting point of this, or maybe the kind of the underlying idea that I want to put in your head right at the, the beginning of this though, is 
you know, we live in a world where uh, pretty, I, I'm guessing almost all of you, if you're in vision and robotics, you have something to do with deep learning, right? Like it's almost impossible to, to do anything without tripping over it in one form or another. Uh, and so I, I've been thinking a lot about that because obviously my group is the same thing. We do a lot of work in deep learning, but these are literally two papers published 20 years apart. Uh, the top paper I published in ICRA 2020, and it was, you might be like, what the heck is this paper? Um, uh, so it was a paper about how could we program vision-based control systems? And at the time, I was doing a lot of work in real-time computer vision. Uh, I was doing a lot of work in vision-based control. And my observation was that, uh, you know, we actually knew how to tell robots what to do using vision, except we couldn't actually really tell them what to do, except in a very narrow sense. So if you look at this, it, you know, it was kind of this notional sense of, well, suppose I could actually write a program like this, locate a screwdriver, uh, locate a, a screw, put the screw in the screwdriver with some geometric constraints around it, and then I could do the action. And the gist of that uh, talk was really, the reason we can't do this is because we can't find a screwdriver and we can't find a screw and we, we can't basically do all of the semantic components it would take to couple vision with a robot. Uh, and I said, you know, this is really our agenda for the next 20 years is to figure out how to fill in those blanks. Well, it's 20 years later and lo and behold, we, we've kind of filled in those blanks, but somehow it didn't go the way I expected uh, because now a program looks like the thing in the bottom, which is basically a loss function for reinforcement learning that just says, here, I'm just gonna write down a reward of some sort and I'm gonna go find enough data that eventually you can regress out the solution to whatever this problem is. And if, if we find enough data and we find the right architecture and we can tweak the loss function in the right way, eventually we'll get ourselves to a solution. And, and you all know that you know, this has just produced uh, amazing results, amazing demonstrations over the last few years. Um, but I'm not convinced that uh, the answer is just data loss functions and inductive bias through an architecture. I think there's still a, a ton of value to thinking about more explicit representations in the system we do. You know, the top part is what we teach most of our computer science undergrads when they're learning to do kind of systems programming and, and kind of computer, kind of classical computer science, I guess, for lack of a better term, which is, you know, you write functions are composable. There's a contract between that function and the rest of the program that says, I'm, I promise to do this. You can debug it, you can read it. I mean, you could all tell exactly what that program was intended to do. Um, we can test it, we can unit test it. There's all this stuff that lets us build really robust code. And it's really what makes planes fly and it makes uh, pretty much all of the automated systems and, and computing systems around us work. And it's, it's through the entire stack. Right, like it's at the hardware level and at the systems level and software, uh, application software and so on and so forth. Um, this top thing, um, it's cool, like we can adapt it to anything. It's very general if you can find all the data and everything, but it, it has almost none of the properties on the top. Like, uh, you know, you can't really debug it. You can figure out it doesn't work and you can try things to make it better. You can't really compose it with other things because it doesn't have any sort of a contract really that says, here's what I promised to do. It, it tends to work in a statistical sense, not very interpretable. Uh, and I mean, you can test it, but testing it is an empirical process. You can't kind of break it down to its components. So I actually kind of the, the thing I want to put in your head as you go through this talk is a lot of what I've been thinking about lately is how do we, how do we live between these two worlds? How do we get the advantages of the thing on the bottom? which lets us take disorganized data and produce outputs that make sense, but still have, take advantage of what we know about problems in a, in a more explicit way. And uh, you know, the, the, the fact is that what I think really drives this in a lot of ways in, in my world is you know, kind of this notion that you know, while we can get bigger and bigger data sets to solve problems, I, I think there's a, a fundamental combinatorial limit here that we have to somehow understand. Namely, like, you know, this is, um, you know, just one example of uh, kind of a, a recent state-of-the-art system that's doing activity recognition applied to different videos. And you can see, you know, these are all riding a bike. 
but they all get different classifications. Why? Because you know the two things on the left are outliers. They're in the long tail, something you would never see before, even though you have no trouble recognizing it. Um, and actually, let me just kind of pop to this. And, and really, the, I think the problem stems from this, which is you know, at a very basic level, we can build systems that get all the parts right. Like they can go and they can segment out a bicycle. They can segment out the thing riding the bicycle. And in your head, as soon as you've got a bicycle and a thing on a bicycle, answer solved, right? Riding a bike. These systems don't have that sort of componentization, that modularity or that composition that says, hey, what I do is I compose the thing and the thing and the action, and that gives me what's going on. They're just looking at the image and trying to get uh, an answer. And so in fact, in this case, even though we can get perfect segmentation, the activity recognition is wrong because it's never seen a dog ride a bicycle before and it can't do that sort of generalization. And in fact, the, uh, the exact, uh, the front raise, should you ever care, is actually it's a, it's a person lifting a weights like this. And so it's basically kind of seeing the dog like this and it's more or less saying, okay, it looks like somebody who's, who's going like that. So that's what it's focused on. So, so with that, my, my goal is to really say, how can we build systems where we use deep learning, we use it at a level where we can use it to structure data, but we don't expose it to the full combinatorics of the problem. We don't say, look, uh, I want you to interpret natural language and therefore I'm gonna build a black box that goes from an image to uh, Shakespearean prose describing uh, a rose. Uh, but in fact, we use it to just pull out the key pieces. And then we start to use more explicit representations on top. And for all the reasons that I showed earlier, that we can, we can actually kind of introspect much more and understand more what's going on. So I'm gonna say a little bit about this, how we do it in the activity recognition vein. I'm gonna do talk and then talk a little bit about it in the, um, the uh, vision-based manipulation sense. And then I'll, I'll give you a peek at, at some current work. And I, I'll say at, up front that, this is you know, really work that uh, is done by, of course, all my students. Uh, I've had, I think, six PhD students finish in the last year. So really what you're seeing is a, a composite of their work uh, kind of put together as, as a way to kind of think about this, this bigger picture that I'm starting to evolve. So I wanna start with um, this notion of activity recognition. Um, and uh, this goes back, it was actually funded originally by IARPA, it was a program called DIVA, where the goal is I would like to take video and I would like to detect certain types of events in the video, but often those events are essentially long tail events almost by definition. I don't care about the average person walking down the street. I care about somebody who's you know, doing something suspicious or something unusual going on. And often it's, it's kind of a, a needle in the haystack sort of problem. Uh, and so almost by definition, you can't just build a big enough data set that eventually it's gonna encompass all this stuff. You're gonna have to do something completely new. Uh, and so we really started to think about this in a, a zero shot learning uh, sense. And so this is kind of the canonical example, you know, find somewhere in some video, an instance where a man wearing a blue shirt approaches a blue SUV and places a brown package near it. So, Again, if you kind of think of all the, the sorts of ways that people can interact with cars, the types of cars, the types of clothes they wear, the combinatorics just says you're never going to have seen all of the different ways to eventually find you know, the example that looks just like this. But each of the components themselves, you, know, you see lots of people with blue shirts, you see lots of blue SUVs, you see lots of brown packages. So how do we compose those together as opposed to trying to do an end-to-end -end solution? So, so yeah, the conventional way to do this would be, you know, I just basically take images, I feed them into some classifier, it predicts something, and then I compare it to the ground truth. And that's how I would actually solve the problem. What we're gonna do is break it apart. And we're gonna say, look, at some level, we're gonna get a visual encoding, but that visual encoding is gonna be at a much more primitive level than the end result that I care about. Then we're gonna take the thing that I'm looking for, we're gonna represent it somehow, and then we can do the comparison in an intermediate space that uh, is neither forcing vision to go all the way to the end product nor forcing the query to somehow go all the way back to the image, but lives, <clears throat> lives somewhere in between. 
And what this gives us also is the ability to, to separate the description of the activity from the recognition of it. So we can also now do zero shot sorts of work. So like that, that dog on a bicycle, and now we can say, look, we've got a dog, we've got a bicycle. And if I code a query that says, just tell me if you ever see a dog and a bicycle together, I can find that easily because I've got perfect detection of a dog and I've got perfect detection of bicycles. So dog riding a bicycle, you know, problem solved as long as I can find dogs and bicycles. So it's as simple as that. Sorry. So, um, sorry, I'm having uh, technical difficulties here. There you go. So, so this is kind of the, the more the formalization of the problem. It just says, well, I'm gonna <clears throat> try to come up with two encodings, essentially one that's an image encoding, takes images and produces a set of what I'll call attributes about that image. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm gonna have a, an action signature, which is just some encoding that describes what it is that I wanna find. And then I'm gonna have some similarity function that compares between the two. Now, this is not a, a new idea by any means. What's really, uh, I think, new about it from the, <clears throat> the point of view of our work is people have tried this in the static image domain, but they hadn't really thought about how do you do this in the, the activity domain. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna lift this idea from static images up to dynamic, image, dynamic activities that occur over time. And so what we really need to do is to say, well, how do we compare a time series of activity signatures to a time series of, uh, of attributes coming from images? Uh, and, you know, math can sometimes make things obscure. So here's a picture that just shows how super simple it is. Here's a car that just drove up. So there's a car, a car exists. The car stopped moving. And now suddenly uh, a human exists where a human didn't exist before and they're near a car. What is that? That's somebody just got out of a car. Uh, and it's you know, a, a totally trivial thing to describe and it's a totally, you know, some very simple action. But it turns out that that's all it takes to, to detect that people are getting out of cars as long as you've got a person detector and a car detector. And it's simple as that. So the, the abstraction here is the way that we describe activities is we describe them really using a, a finite state system. So we have a, a description. You can think of it as kind of the cartoonization of this action. Uh, it's an acceptor that we write as logic. At the same time, we've got a, an observation transducer that's just popping out <clears throat> all of the attributes that we're looking at. So in this particular case, it happens to be looking at uh, its detection of a person. And so the detection of the person goes from a low probability to high probability. You compose these two together and what you end up with is a transducer that simply you know, consumes time points and keeps spitting out uh, probabilities uh, that a, a person exists. You then go backwards through that, or person doesn't exist and then does exist. So that the, the sequence of probabilities follows the logic you've laid out uh, and you can basically go back and out and say, well, what's the probability that this particular activity occurred in the video versus other activities or, or, other, um, or looking in other areas of the video for this activity? Yep, probability is the output in that one. So it's just doing detection, <clears throat> on and on and on. Uh, so it's, it really, you know, the simplest way to think of it is it's a dot product between a vector of here's the stuff we want to see and here's the detections we have. The only trick <clears throat> I will say in this is we can't prescribe times. If I knew five frames, the person's not going to be there and then the person's going to appear, then you know, it, would be, it literally would be dot product. The only thing is you've now got to basically optimize the window over this to say, well, where does this pattern actually fit best? Uh, across the time series. <clears throat> so I basically uh, took you through this. So here's a, an example of the sort of things that we ran this on. So these are videos taken from different... Oh, sure. <clears throat> nope. We actually, we do not back prop, we don't train through the whole system. I mean, we thought about it, frankly, as well, you know, once we've done this, should we do that? But 
because we're operating mostly in a zero shot setting, we typically don't actually have a lot of data. We, we, you know, we, for testing, we obviously have that data, but uh, we've never had a big training set where we went back and said, could we do it going through the, the function, but you could. So <clears throat> this is the sort of uh, video data we were given. So these are five different surveillance cameras. You can see they're basically looking at parking lots and, and open fields. So really kind of far field video, um, very different than the sort of stuff you typically see in computer vision conferences where, you know, it's, it's a video of people this big, you know, where it's fairly easy to detect them and interacting. And people are, the smallest people we detect are about 20 pixels high, you know, walking somewhere far out in a parking lot. Uh, and so what we did is we kept, <clears throat> aside uh, one set of videos from one of the cameras that the system never gets to see, we use the other videos to basically train and do all the tuning of the system. And so we're really testing in this case, whether we can um, detect a, uh, you know, a pedestrian in a situation we've never seen. So, uh, and this is just giving you a sense of what the, the video looks like. So if I hadn't given you the, um, the video, all the annotations, I dare you to find some of these activities. So for example, if you look in the middle, there's this person enters a vehicle. You can see it <clears throat> once you know to look there, but I'm, I'm guessing most of you would have had a hard time um, picking up the fact that there was some little person getting in and out of a car back there. So those are the sorts of things that we're trying to detect in this video. It's not just a big person getting in and out of a car, kind of what you saw before. So. Um, the, uh, this is just to kind of give you a sense of the results. So unsurprisingly, I, I wouldn't be talking about it if it didn't work. So if you just look at things like entering and exiting, uh, we get a significantly higher performance on these videos. And the reason is super simple. <clears throat> the amount of video data that you have is simply not large enough to train an end-to-end -end system to solve this problem. And so most of the things we're comparing against the supervised, you can see you know, 57, 63%, we're at 85, and it's because they, they just could never actually train to the point that they could test on an independent video and get uh, reasonable results. And even in the zero shot setting, so in a case where we don't look at the video at all, we just take off the shelf detectors and we apply it, uh, we're still outperforming even the, the best zero shot systems. Right. And, are, you, are you just looking <clears throat> So we basically uh, look at the traces. So the best way to think of it is you're going through, you've got a sequence of probabilities of, think of a ticker tape of detectors that are all running and they're all spitting out probabilities. And, and there's all, uh, you know, we know the location too. So there's a probability here that some person pop tied. So you've got this big ticker tape of activities. And you're saying there are certain patterns over time which would correlate with somebody getting out of a car. So it's exactly that a car has to be there. So the car detector is positive. You know, the person appears, uh, the person's close to a car and so on and so forth. So we, we basically kind of combing through this big ticker tape and just saying, hey, here's an example of where that pattern appeared. And the way we describe the pattern is just a, a finite state system. And as I was saying to Costas, the only trick is <clears throat> the coordination between all of those has to be, <clears throat> excuse me, certain out somewhat arbitrary because we, we can't say, okay, you, you wait uh, you know, 50 seconds and then this happens. But you know, we did this for Diva. Uh, oh, and just let me kind of, this is my proselytization of, of all this, which is, so one of the, the neat things about it is because we had this explicit representation, we could actually debug and improve the system pretty quickly. So this was one example where <clears throat> we said, look, there's this action heavy carry and there's this action pulling something on the ground. And we had to, uh, we, we, at one point we realized the system was getting these confused because both of them had kind of a similar body posture and that you have an object next to you in both cases. And so it was very easy to look and say, oh, well, all we have to do is to basically add a spatial constraint that says pulling is something on the ground and carry is something off the ground. And suddenly we could uh, discriminate uh, between the two of these. 
don't, th these numbers are a kind of a funky number, so lower is better in this case. Uh, they're not actually accuracies or a different number we had to report. Um, and also, like, as I said, we can debug. So we can look and say, well, what failed in this case? Was it the logic or was it the detector? <clears throat> in this case, it happened to be the detector that failed. So this is, this is all bread and butter computer science, right? Like, because we have this more explicit representation, we can go, we can debug, we can see where the issues are, decide if we need to retrain models, change our logic. It's, it's, it's way more flexible than an end-to-end -end system. I will just say, you know, it, it, we, we, we developed this in Diva, but obviously to, to really say it's more general, you wanna look at other uh, examples. So this is uh, the Olympic sports data set. Um, so, for example, bowling, we have a finite state descriptor of what it means to throw a ball in bowling, uh, and we can do all the detections uh, for that. Uh, and so we, we ran this uh, benchmark and the same sort of thing. We get um, a significantly better performance. So ZSL is zero-shot learning. Uh, that's probably the one to pay the most attention to. GZSL is just a slight variation on how they, they frame zero-shot learning. But Again, you know, the highest benchmark, at least at the time of publication, was 60%, and we're up well over 70% in this case. Yeah? Um, so how often was it the case that you found it to be insufficient to use one single descriptor for an action category? Or were there other kinds of difficulties that encountered by trying to come up with that? Yeah. So I, you know, at this point, we're back to programming. So you're exactly right. There, there are corner cases that, that come up. Um, so I think heavy carry is probably a great example where uh, you know, we, we wrote down a logic description that we thought would account for it. And then it turned out there was a confusion set and we, we disambiguated it. Um, I, I would say that most of the fixes are obvious. Like once you look at it, it's very clear why it's distinguished, why you're having this, this issue and you simply add another constraint. The, the way I think of it is all of the deep learning systems we produce, like a lot of the results we're comparing against, they're all statistical, right? So the question in the field today is how quickly can I move the performance bar up? And I never expect perfection. I expect some statistical accuracy. And, and most of what we observed and we were doing this is we were competing against people who are trying to do end-to-end -end training of system and we were moving the performance bar up significantly faster than the people who are trying to, to do the end-to-end -end training. So, so is it perfect? No, there's always edge cases that it doesn't cover. Uh, but uh, those edge cases, we discover them faster and we address them more quickly than most of the people who are trying to figure out how to then tweak the loss function in some way so that now this edge case gets covered. Uh, and I will say, this is something I have noticed pervasively uh, is uh, we're in a world where the first recourse for almost everybody is how do I train a deep learning system to do something? <clears throat> and I've now like found three or four times where I could say, you know what, if we simplify the deep learning and we complexify the logic on top of it a little bit, we actually, our gradient is faster than if we try to figure out how to, to deal with like all the tuning and edge cases. Uh, and, and so that's part of the reason I'm kind of saying this. Like, it's not a, a hard idea to grasp, right? It's just, it requires you to think across both the, the, the kind of programming logic side of things and the deep learning side of things. But you're exactly right that eventually you'll get to a point of diminishing returns with this too, where like you're tweaking parameters and they don't make sense anymore. Let me just, uh, just say that, you know, once we, we did this, um, because uh, we live in a world of deep learning, we did ask ourselves, well, could we get some of the same sort of compositionality appearing in uh, a deep learned system? So we did publish a paper uh, after this where we essentially used a supervised attention mechanism to supervise a, an appearance pathway and a motion pathway. And the supervision is basically the detection. So you run a detector, you get boxes for the objects, and you use that to supervise an attention mechanism for the object pathway. And it turned out we could actually get a, a similar sort of um, compositionality out of the system. So this is the something, 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 uh, the something else data set, something, something V2. 
uh, that's it. Uh, where the whole idea here is you've got uh, this strong compositionality principle. You're, you place uh, some object that, next to another object. I place a cup next to a monitor. I place a plate next to a fork. And so you've got a set of verbs, you've got a set of nouns. <clears throat> and so it, it's a great place to test this uh, a, a notion of how much independence do you have between what you're doing and what you're doing it with. Uh, and you know, kind of using this whole idea of of driving a separate pathway for the what, as opposed to what are you doing, turned out we could even in the deep learning world start to, to gain something in terms of understanding compositionality. And I'm kind of saying this mostly to set up this notion in your head that really what we were working on before, it ended up that this notion of composition uh, in language is what we were taking advantage of. We were detecting nouns and we were describing verbs. This system, detects objects uh, and it uses now a deep learning component to also represent the verbs. And we're able to show we could get a, a similar sort of independence between those two, meaning what we're actually doing here is we're testing a compositional split where we, for example, get seen next to for a set of objects. Uh, and now when we test it, next to will appear, but with objects it's never seen before. And conversely, it may not have seen uh, a particular uh, you know, verb uh, object combination in some other context, and now we introduce it in that context. So it, it's doing kind of almost a zero shot like task. It's seeing new examples of compositions that it's never seen before. So we can actually get these deep learning systems to have this sort of compositional framework, but it, it really was kind of informed by this structure that we developed first uh, outside. So let's see, how am I doing on time? So let me just um, kind of pop ahead and, and kind of pick up on one other thread that this uh, I wanted to illustrate about this. So, so we now have this uh, explicit system for um, representing activities. Now, at the same time, I had a project going on, Jonathan Jones, uh, working with some cognitive scientists, where we were trying to understand people doing assemblies. And the, the problem here was uh, almost the other side, namely, uh, let's see if I can uh, show this picture. So the task was, we um, had a bunch of kids who were coming in and they were playing with Duplos. And the cognitive scientists wanted to understand how kids built with Duplos. Uh, and their problem is, is getting data in a structured form. They can take videos of lots of kids playing with Duplos and then somebody has to sit there and manually like grade it and say, okay, they did this, they did this, they did this, they did this. And it's, <clears throat> it's not very fine grained because you just can't get people to sit down and say, well, they took the red block and they rotated it 90 degrees and then they joined it to the green block at exactly this location. And then they took you know, another block and they rotated it and moved it here. And then they took one out. Like it, it just, it's hard to get that granularity. So we said, well, look, could we use some of these ideas to just understand this building process? And to make a long story short, um, you know, Jonathan uh, built a system. But it, <clears throat> one thing I'll point out about this is the, the system I just showed you is kind of a, an action focused system. This is an object focus system. This is saying, I'm building a kinematic structure. Can I monitor how that kinematic structure has been assembled? I don't really care what the person is doing. I'm just gonna look at the assembly. So in this case, people are irrelevant. Uh, it's really the assembly we care about. So Jonathan built a system for the, um, the kids and the Duplos. We have some papers about that. But what uh, occurred to me uh, late in the game is, we actually have two complementary pieces here. We've got <coughs> Jonathan who had done this, this Duplo-based system. So it was describing how you build kinematics. And I had TK who was doing this action-based system, which didn't care about the, the result of these actions. It just wanted to say somebody got out of a car. And so the obvious question was, well, could we put these two together? Does knowing something about what you're trying to do, provide a constraint to the actions that you're performing and do the actions you're performing provide some constraint about the assembly that you're trying to do. And so uh, we basically ended up uh, putting these two together. So instead of, you know, TK scored actions in his time series model, 
Jonathan was scoring kinematic assemblies in his time series model. And we literally just put them together. So you now have a score that, that looks both at actions and it looks at the kinematic assembly itself. Uh, and now we can actually kind of jointly parse uh, into what's happening. So um, the, the test case for this was Ikea furniture. So this is one of my kind of long held uh, desires was after assembly Ikea furniture for myself and my kids and everybody else that there'd finally be a, a robot that could do this. Um, so there is actually an Ikea furniture data set, should you care, which has a bunch of different Ikea furniture uh, being assembled. It's videos of all that furniture. Um, you can see there are a bunch of objects or a bunch of verbs. Uh, and there's a description of what's going on with this. So for example, it'll say uh, you take a leg and you uh, screw it into a tabletop. And so to do this correctly, you basically want to be able to both say, I attached a leg to a table and you want to say something about the action screw in. Uh, so we were able to put this together and <clears throat> I just, point out that the one number that I think is, is the most interesting in all this under the assemblies is we have 100% correct edit distance for assembly, which means we were actually perfect at telling you exactly which parts were being assembled to which uh, table at any point in time, which if you have ever assembled IKEA furniture, you realize that's actually the one thing that you would care about, because I would like to know when I just put the screw into the wrong piece. And about five steps later, I'm gonna suddenly regret it because I now have to take everything apart again. But, but the, the only way we could actually get to this point was essentially to combine both the action side and the, the object side. So the kind of meta point about this is we were actually able to do this combination because we had a very explicit system for representing actions. And we had a very explicit system for describing assembly we actually could very quickly glue the two together and we actually get the power of both working together on top of this. So again, this kind of notion of modularity. Uh, this data set, <clears throat> I have to actually, I don't remember if it has markers or not. I, 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 I yeah, I don't wanna say if, if this one, has, we have our own data set that has markers, but I don't think this, I don't remember this data set having markers. All right, so let me kind of finish up quickly here with just a kind of a, a last comment about this whole notion of, of composition and putting things together. And I want to do it more from the manipulation side of things. Uh, so this is Andrew Hunt who just finished, um, it's now at Georgia Tech as a CI fellow with uh, Matthew Gombele. Uh, uh, Andrew was really interested in this question of how can we build vision-based manipulation systems that are both efficient to train and have this sort of reusability property that I just illustrated with some of the activity recognition work that we did. As I'm sure as most of you know, reinforcement learning is not known for having uh, any sort of compositional properties associated with it or modularity. You train an end-to-end -end system to, to perform a task. So um, <clears throat> what Andrew started with is, is super simple. He just said, look, um, I wanna first just build a a uh, reinforcement learning system that can solve a stacking problem. Um, so, you know, his setup looks like this to start with. I don't know if this will play or not. Eh, maybe it will. Um, so it's, you know, what we ultimately want to do is to say things like put the yellow block on top of the blue block. Uh, you know, this is like Curry Winograd from the 1970s, but now it's being done in, in the deep learning phase. So, so kind of think that this is our holy grail. I want a robot that can just follow my instructions. But because the instructions are coming from natural language, um, that means that, again, this kind of notion of compositionality or has to somehow be in there because I can't train the robot to do absolutely every task with every object known to man. So um, I can get this to advance. There we go. Um, so uh, just briefly, the, the, 
architecture he uses looks like this. And this is part of, again, this notion of building something that has more of an explicit representation instead of a, uh, a black box. So we go from images to uh, deciding actions like push or grasp or place. So a task gets decomposed into actual actions. It's not just a full black box end to end thing. And if you look at the representation of actions, we have a very explicit representation uh, of what an action means in terms of the reward that it produces. So if you look, for example, at the, the, uh, the bottom, there's a, a set of objects you can see that are kind of bright. Those are places that would be high reward to place an object. Uh, whereas if you look, for example, at the, the middle, you can see there are a few bright objects. Those are objects that would be uh, likely to produce a high reward if you grasp them. Now, this particular system doesn't care about colors or anything. So it, it really was just trained to do block stacking and row building. Those were its kind of two core tasks. Um, and so, uh, oh, and I guess the other thing I should say is the reason that these are tiled is we produce a, a reward per location and per orientation. So we're actually basically uh, computing actions in the plane. So you're seeing all the images going through a set of rotations. So when we pick an action, we can basically pick a position and an orientation to do that action. So it's a, a spatial map of the actions you could do. Um, uh, Andrew's thesis, I won't go into the details, basically created a, a different reward system that made it easy to, to efficiently train these RL systems. Um, so he, uh, one of the cool things about it was he was efficient enough, he could actually train uh, with a single robot uh, in the lab, uh, essentially overnight to do uh, things like block stacking. Um, we also trained in simulation. Uh, and in fact, one of the neat things about this was, um, we were able to show that if we, first, if we just did work in simulation, we get the results you'd like to expect, which is you know, the blue bars, everything that, that we do works great and is efficient relative to other reward structures that you use in, in RL. But we also um, did full sim to real transfer. So it turned out we could train this in simulation and it worked just about as well in the real world as it worked uh, in simulation. And I could go into the reasons for that, but, the, the bottom line is we were able to build this system now that was really efficient at building rows and, and stacking blocks, but those were its end goals. That's like all it knew how to do. And so then we started to say, well, can we take it apart and actually solve that original problem? Uh, and so we uh, pulled in our, our NLP friends and said, all right, how would you guys go about now uh, helping us tell our robot what to do as opposed to just having it do it by rote task? Uh, and, and the idea is actually really simple. Uh, and it goes all the way back to, you know, the beginning where we we're talking about this language composition. Uh, there is, if I say, put the yellow block on top of the blue block, um, and I'm looking at the image, that defines for me a set of targets. It defines a target that uh, is something I want to pick up. I think I said the yellow block and it defines a location, the blue block. So I wanna teach a language component or train a language component that accepts descriptions and it outputs a spatial map of objects that would be consistent with what it is that I want to do. Uh, and of course, um, this spatial map should be logically consistent with the spatial map that I'm already building in the action space, which it turns out is not particularly hard to do. And so, that in the end is, is kind of the, the beauty of the simplicity of the solution is we essentially take a uh, natural language statement like stack the blue block and the red block, uh, and we take an image, we tile the image, and we essentially feed both of these to a transformer, uh, which is you know, the, the solution du jour for solving any complex problem. Um, so we plug this into a transformer, we train the transformer such that what it produces as an output is a set of tiles, which are the activation energy for that particular action in that particular scene. And now it's as simple as just composing those two representations explicitly. So, you know, we, we basically 
train this thing. Let's see if I can find the, uh, the slide I want here. So we essentially train this thing and we get a transformer that uh, outputs the mask, or you can think of it really as a set of weights. Let's say here are the places in the image that would be good for this particular action. Uh, we have a deep learn system that says for a particular action, here's a good place to act. We compose those two together and it says, aha, that's the best blue block in the scene right now for you to pick up if you actually want to stack blocks. Um, so we published this in Coral just this year, uh, and we get really super high uh, accuracy. So what this is like looking at the, the bottom numbers there, what we're, what we're basically doing is we're giving it a recipe for how to build a stack. And we're saying, okay, how often do you build the correct stack? And you know, we said, put the red block and the blue block on the green block or whatever. Uh, and uh, it has to go out and uh, do that. Uh, and in particular, the, the left side is the goal prediction and the right side is the, the ultimate performance uh, on the real world data. But the, the, the kind of key point about this is we never had to retrain our deep learning system for the robot. That stayed invariant. We trained the language model and then we put the two together. And if the language model gets better, the task performance gets better. If our robot manipulation gets better, this gets better. We never have to worry about this joint training problem or this coupling problem where, uh, you know, I'm cascading the two. And so if I make one better, I've got to retrain the other to, to accept the, the input of the other. And, and this is something that again, goes all the way back to that program I showed you. It, there's an invariance that's going on here. That means we can improve things in parallel as opposed to having them coupled together uh, with each other. So let me just kind of quickly finish with a, a couple of things that are going on now uh, that kind of build on this. So I've been talking about compositionality a lot. And so we wanted to ask the question, can we now get the same sort of compositionality out of this system that we could get out of those earlier systems? Uh, so I have a new grad student, Vicky Zeng, who uh, started to work on this. So what she did is we added um, more shapes. Uh, we've got stars and we've got cylinders. Uh, and we added sizes, we've got bigs, medium and small. So we now have a combinatorial set of objects, you know, small c combinatorial, uh, but we can now do things like held out testing and training. Uh, we can say, um, you've never had to put a green block on top of a red block, but maybe you've had to put blue blocks on top of yellow blocks. So if we train you on yellow blocks and blue blocks, and now we say put a green block on a red block, um, can you still do that? Uh, and the answer is uh, really this works uh, surprisingly well. So we, we test and held out uh, against just random. So random means we just sample all possible compositions uh, and train, on, train the transformer on it. Uh, and uh, unseen means that we've held out a set of compositions it's never seen before. And you can see, you know, we, we see a performance drop, but nothing radical. So this system actually, has actually started to learn some notion of, of compositionality of language. It separated the action from the object in, a, in an appropriate way, or separated also the, the interactions between the objects in an appropriate way. So I'm, I'm super excited about this because I think it actually is starting to set us on the road of having this, this holy grail of being able to literally tell the robot what to do with a set of objects maybe it's never seen before and actually having it uh, perform a task. The other thing I've been thinking about, uh, and actually I think more and more about this, is um, how to quantify the performance of these systems. Uh, and, and I think about this for the following reason. Um, way back when I showed you that program at the beginning, that those interfaces were a contract. They, they said, look, I promise that you call me and I will do something for you. Uh, and right now, one of the, the issues I see, and particularly now that I, I've been working on the, the industry side of things too, I see it, is you know, we don't have the same notion of contract for deep learning systems. We're engineering around them, but we don't, you don't really say, well, here's the interface to my deep learning system and here's exactly what it promises to do. It's more kind of like, um, you know, if you call me, sometimes I will detect the objects that you want me to detect. And if I don't detect them, you're gonna have to figure out what to do because I can't do anything about that. Uh, and I, I think we need to be able to quantify and create interfaces that are more invariant, more immutable than that. Um, so Molly O'Brien 
started to, to uh, work in this problem, she just finished, where she really said, you know, how do we train a system, <clears throat> get performance statistics, but then now predict how it's gonna generalize in a new domain that you've never seen before. Uh, and she kind of approached it in a couple of different phases. The first is, let's suppose I have a lot of metadata. Can I just use metadata to predict? That is to say, I trained on 80% sunny images and 20% nighttime images for pedestrian detection, but now I'm gonna deploy it on something that's gonna run 80% time, of the time at night and 20% of the time of the day. What's the performance gonna be? Well, you basically disaggregate by the metadata that you have day and night and say, okay, let's say how well it did in the day, how well it did at night. We change the prior statistics and that'll give us a prediction. The problem is that what if you have lots and lots of metadata and you don't know which ones uh, correlate? Uh, and so she had some nice results that said, just give me all the metadata you can think of. And what she uh, effectively did is to say, well, let me find the, the context, context space that is most relevant to predicting the output of the loss. Uh, and so she used a, a mutual information idea to do that. So basically you give me a big feature vector and I will try to tell you here are the things that are most predictive and then use that to predict performance. So that was kind of the first step in this. And then the next step was to say, well, what if you don't have metadata, can you use the embedding itself? And that's some of the work that we're doing right now is to say, can we bubble up just from the embeddings the dimensions that most impact the loss function. And then if I go to a new domain, can I look at the change in the embeddings and use that as a way to start to predict what I think the change in performance is. This is still very much work in progress, but it is work that I'm super excited about because <clears throat> uh, I think if we could do this and do it reliably, we now have a way to start to think about what does it mean to validate a deep learning system or have a contract around a deep learning system, which is I will give you performance at this level in this particular domain. And if you shift the domain, you have to redo the testing, but <clears throat> I can update my contract to tell you what this performance is gonna be and actually build against what we expect the performance to be as opposed to discovering it essentially uh, after we deploy. Uh, and you know, we have some results that show that of course we do better than, than other people at this. All right, <clears throat> let me just close by saying so, this is the academic research I'm doing, and uh, you know, you've kind of seen it's, it, it covers a lot of ground. Um, I did want to say, uh, you know, I am at Amazon right now, and I think a lot of the sorts of things that I'm talking about here, I, I, I find are, you know, interesting to think about also from the, the real world point of view, and the real world is informing um, to some degree what I, I actually think are interesting research questions to perform. Um, so I, I do work in physical stores. Uh, you can either go to an Amazon Go store or you can use one of our dash parts or you can use the, the palm reader. Um, there's a lot of interesting science that we do. It's very similar to, uh, again, what I've talked about here. Um, the main thing that I will uh, say is uh, um, if you are at all interested in the sort of stuff that I've talked about or in general, the sort of application of these ideas in the real world, uh, I'd also like to talk to you because we are hiring. I'm building a group in uh, HQ2 in uh, Washington, down in uh, the Arlington area. So uh, we have positions open. Uh, so this is just an ad for my, my other sponsor to say, if, if you don't want to go to uh, LCSR and be a postdoc or a faculty member or a grad student, come down to me and you can be an applied scientist or a data scientist or a, a machine learning engineer. And, and we will have fun uh, there as well. <clears throat> So with that, let me just finish by uh, thanking everybody. As I said, this is a lot of the work of my students, of course, uh, and my colleagues and collaborators. Uh, and let me thank you for, for your attention and particularly for those of you in the room for coming in person and actually uh, uh, being here. So thank you. Oh, that's right. You got the mic. Um, so in the early part of the talk, we spoke about these um, <coughs> uh, noun detectors that you would then compose to try and determine what actions were happening in scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, you were relying on the uh, confidences of those object detectors, right? And these are kind of notoriously uh, uncalibrated. Fickle. Yeah. 
did you did you have any issues with trying to use those confidences directly? Did you have to kind of calibrate them in some way afterwards for them to be effective? Well, so I guess two things. First, you're exactly right. Uh, and kind of back to the very last thing I talked about with, with Maui's work, I've started to get very deep into this whole question of how do we calibrate confidences? Because this notion of a contract, I think, comes down to that. I think a contract is actually an answer and a confidence value. And if the confidence value is not invariant in some way, then um, we're back to the same old world of, of uh, not being able to rely on it. So you're, that's a perfect question. In our case, we were you know, effectively optimizing as opposed to thresholding. So we, at some point, we do have a couple of thresholds and you're right, we have to basically tune them for those confidences. But the other thing to know is we were using mostly off the shelf detectors. So we weren't retraining the detectors to, to improve performance. We just used them off the shelf. So they were at least invariant. We didn't have to, to tweak them. So you know, through some combination of the factor maximizing the fact that we had largely invariant detectors, it was never a big issue for us. But, yeah, thank you. But it's a big issue in the real world. <clears throat> we need a parabolic mic that we can just point at people in the audience. So actually, I just want to ask the same question, but from the other side, it seems uh, uh, one thing I really like about it. In some sense, you could think of the uh, actions as effectively a structured prediction problem. So if you're you're looking at basketball, you're looking for for a pick and roll that actually uh, could help in some sense to uh, fill in missing detections or other problems right. that you might have because you have certain structures that you're looking for a priori. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I was just wondering whether there, there are instances where, yeah, knowing what you're about uh, can help, uh, actually. Um, yeah, no, you're exactly right. Actually, the place where this came up a lot was in that DIVA example, <clears throat> because a lot of times the um, information you have about something is not temporally proximal to the point that you actually need that information. For example, somebody got out of a car I'm sure you noticed that one example, the person was largely occluded. The time that you actually detect a person is when they leave the car. You say, hey, look, there's a person there. And your mind kind of goes backwards and says, I wonder if that person got out of that car. And, and so what you can do is you can scroll backwards in the video and say, okay, I have a hypothesis that there could be a partial person here. Let me go and, and verify that hypothesis. And, and I, I see that sort of same kind of temporal dislocation show up uh, over and over again, where there's evidence downstream that something took place and you have to then upstream and there was, the pieces were there, but you couldn't put them together at the time because they were too partial, but they support the hypothesis you can, you can form downstream. We didn't do a lot of that, but that was one of the obvious failure modes that we had where a detector would fail and then downstream you would see something and as a human, you could go back and say, hey, you know, now I can see it because I know what to look for, but we never implemented it. Costas? Yes. So the, uh, the reinforcement learning part, uh, in particular, the last one with the uh, stacking, mm -hmm. um, is the, the reward only the success or failure? of the, or you have any distance between what was the robot told to do and what was the outcome? Um, so the, well, so we, we accumulate statistics in a few different ways. Uh, the reinforcement learning is basically success or failure. Like its reward is I'm trying to build a stack and the stack fell down or not. Or in the, the language case, you know, we, we train in simulation so there we can get color too. So we say it was the color right that you, you put on top of the stack. But, um, but we calculate statistics in terms of the, the others as well. So, um, and, and then I will say there's one minor caveat to that, which is uh, the key part of Andrew's thesis was um, this uh, good robot reward as he called it. And the key idea of good robot is figuring out a way to reward partial progress. Um, so the big issue with the robot, what made ro um, stacking, for example, inefficient was you would build a stack at three blocks and then they would fall over and that would be a negative signal. Yeah. And so you had a lot of positive progress, 
but that progress basically got washed out because it got a negative signal. So the one thing that he builds in is he has a notion of a progress indicator in his reward function, and he's able to basically lock in partial rewards. So, so in that sense, it's, it's binary, but it's binary um, with the ability to reward partial credit over time. So you could say, look, you got three together, that's that good. My yeah. I will, by the way, as an aside, it, it's cool that finally, after uh, almost 40 years of doing this, I can go to my robot and say, pick up a red block and put it on a green block, and it does it. <laughs> I had to wait a long time for that to happen. I'm curious about bias, and we know that classifiers have bias by the data that they're trained on, and right. I'm wondering specifically if the logic that you're coupling this with could be a counter, could somehow help overcome some of that bias, or if by building these logic models, you're just adding another source of bias that we need to be considering? That's a great question. Uh, and the answer is both. I mean, obviously we can build whatever logic we wanna build into the models. The, and so in that sense, they're almost by definition inductive bias. Like uh, you know, part of the reason it works is because we've said, look, we're not gonna let you do certain things, we're not gonna let you do other things. But um, the one thing I will say is it's now explicit, right? So there is a, there is a, a transaction that's taking place there that you can monitor. You can say, you know, uh, okay, it, it turns out, well, two things I'll say actually. One is there's a, an explicit transaction. So we know why it's doing it and when. The other thing is kind of back to the debugging thing. When it fails, we can also drill down to a much more granular level and say, what part of the system failed? And is it due to a bias in the data set or is it due to a bias in the structure of the algorithm that we built on top of the data set? So it, it has that, that sort of ability to be, um, that you can introspect a lot more, and at least you can answer the questions. You know, the fix is a whole different story, but we can at least detect that there's a, a possibility there. Uh, from Zoom, uh, it's from Laura Haddock. How, uh, do you have any sense of how or whether your work on compositionality would extend to environments where a sense of continuous dynamics is critical to semantic understanding rather than just discretized actions? Um, for example, hand, handing off an object slowly versus throwing an object, or are your models restricted to activities uh, you are able to discretize effectively? Oh, thanks for that question. I, I think it's ironic when I, I've got Dan sitting here who's spent his whole life thinking about dynamical systems and <laughs> composition. composition yeah. Exactly. I can juggle too, remember? Uh, anyway. um, so uh, the answer to that is, you know, we can use whatever you can detect. So if, if you've got a notion for uh, you know, a quantification for dynamics like speed, uh, we can certainly say, you know, to recognize something is happening, it has to involve an actor, it has to involve an object, and it has to happen at a certain speed. And if it doesn't happen at that speed, we're not going to accept it. So, you know, dropping a ball is different than throwing a ball because dropping the ball, it goes straight down and it's slowly. And if uh, it's throwing, there is a velocity and, you know, the ball leaves you. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't see any fundamental limits to allowing us to, to, to do these sorts of things. It really is a question of what are the set of attributes in the language that you have? And, you know, to what degree do those, you know, what, what's the ultimate limit here? The ultimate limit here is the limit we've always faced in computer vision, which is you, you have a language of description and you have a set of uh, algorithms which are detecting things related to that description, and then you express something. There are long tail events that do not fit that description uh, that are somewhere in the fuzzy boundary. And, and those we, we don't deal with either because the detection framework fails or because our description is inadequate for that. Um, deep learning people go back to saying, well, that just means you need more data because eventually you'll be able to train the algorithm to address that long tail. But my argument is that long tail only keeps getting longer and longer and longer. Uh, and so at some point you're basically burning the world down, just trying to find data to, to recognize things. But that's a long answer to a short question, which is, yeah, we could deal with dynamics. We just need to be able to um, apprehend dynamics and represent them in some way. So I had a question. Um, 
it seems like a lot of the descriptions that you worked with is in natural language, but have you considered like a different type of like um, representation uh, other than natural language? Such as? <laughs> I don't know. I, was, I, was kind of... <laughs> I see you're, you're throwing it over the fence and seeing what I do with it. Um, well, I mean, look, so we, in the uh, DIVA case, we never really used natural language, right? We wrote explicit models that were finite state systems. So we were taking natural language in our head and, and turning it into those formal representations. And ultimately, the formal representations is the, the interface into the deep learning world. So however you want to create those formal representations is up to you, you know, if you want to... Um, you want to use natural language that's great if you've got you know you want to look at it so actually one piece maybe to give you an example of, of other possibilities so one of the pieces of work i didn't talk about was demonstration so we've actually used that same rl based system as a basis to do tasks by demonstration so i demonstrate to you uh, for example building a pyramid which is some combination of stacks and rows um, and then i want the robot to to emulate that uh, and so there, you know, we're using demonstration as the basis for the, um, the language of telling the robot what to do and then pushing that into the, um, the action system and having it emulated. So, so, you know, kind of generally communication is gesture and language, right? And we're kind of trying to do both right now. They're separate, but eventually they really should be together. Yeah, like for me, like I work in multi-robot systems and like, like say you want to collaborate with another robot, like would the best way to perform collaboration, would it be through natural language or would it be through like a different type of descriptor? Yeah, I mean, one of the other things that I'm doing in the you know, somehow manifold things that I do is um, working with uh, one of my HRI colleagues and we're talking about uh, training and, and how do you, in teams, how do you do training? And there are a lot of indirect signals in training. So I can instruct you what to do, I can say, put this part here, I can show you what to do. But then there, there are these indirect communication signals, like I look at what you're trying to do and you're confused. And so then I'll change my communication mode. Maybe I'll both demonstrate and say it at the same time, or maybe I'll find some other indirect path to do it. And I, I think that sort of closed loopness, that interactivity between these systems is something that, that is, is super interesting and we don't have right now. It's how do you not just, uh, you know, take input and emit an output, but then close the loop and say, based on what I see happening with that output, I'm going to change the way that I, I communicate or act in the world. Thank you. Um, I have a question on the block stacking. Um, I guess my general question is it seems to be quite a task specific architecture in the sense that you're giving like a top-down bird's eye view of the blocks, which mm -hmm. seems to be like the optimal viewpoint. Um, and then you're doing like a pixel wise, like you're, you're, you're predicting pixel yeah. wise. You we're know, we're very like explicit. Um, have you thought about how this like translates to more difficult we're, tasks like 3D furniture assembly, or even just trying the block stacking with a different viewpoint, like from the front or something? Um, no, I think that's a super question. Uh, and I think the answer is, you know, fairly obvious. I think, uh, you know, if we were to move to a full 3D spatial representation, we would be able to do obviously a lot more things. Um, what I couldn't tell you right now is the scalability of that representation to 3D, you know, going from 3D to 6D obviously is, is quite a lot. Um, we're not doing that yet. I, I have a student who's actually playing around with something that, that verges on that, but it, to me, I think that would be my natural, my natural uh, response to that. I think what, what is more interesting, though, is uh, maybe going back to the dynamics question. If I really wanted to, so I know how to, to represent and recognize dynamical activities, but if I wanted to tell the robot to do something dynamical, now I think that representation kind of goes out the window, right? Because now I've got to somehow not just represent state, but I've got to represent dynamics on state in that representation so if i say throw the blue block how do i represent um i can represent the blue block but how do i represent the right kind of throwing action it's not a great example but kind of carries that that information so so i think you're you you're spot on that you know everything that we did 
really was built around this simplification and we did it you know intentionally so we could do all the stuff we wanted to do without going crazy but i i think i could get it to 3d space i don't know if i could get it to 3d space plus dynamics yeah thank you and um i guess i have one more question so um in the finite state machine slide you had um i guess my main thought is that you rely on human knowledge to construct the finite state machines mm -hmm. so that you know you can get good zero shot um performance. Mm -hmm. So would it be interesting to uh, maybe try to construct some finite st state machines from data um, mm -hmm. and like, you know, semi automate the process? Yeah, you obviously you can't automate it fully. But um, in this way, you can maybe rely less and less on and human the yeah. yeah, when we did this, uh, and this is, you know, one of my unfulfilled dreams is, I said, really, that's a first order approximation, right? We're doing it exactly to say, because, you know, just kind of common sense says this is what this particular action is, but kind of getting back to the long tail and, and kind of the, the border cases, as you run this, you're gonna gather data. And as you're gathering data, you'd like to be able to slowly but surely evolve the model to be something that's you know, Bayes optimal in terms of whatever uh, situation you're facing. So you can almost think of the, the finite state system as like a regularizer on top of something that you're learning that says, look, you should be somewhere around here, but as more data comes in, your set point can kind of drift further and further away if you need to do that to accommodate corner cases. One way to do it would be to just train, as you say, just kind of explicitly train a, a transducer that's now a, uh, not a, a zero one logic, but something probabilistic, which would you know, allow us to tweak the system, but that we didn't do. Any other questions? <laughs>